Good morning, church family. How's everybody today? Glad to be in God's house. Say amen. Let's sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He died for me. He died for me. He died for me. He died for me. He's so good to me. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's so
the resurrection. Resurrection Sunday. For us as Christians, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. We serve a risen God. Amen? Amen? And I can't help but think that when those two ladies came to the tomb and saw that Jesus was not there, they probably said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, to the people shout before his name. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth from the depths of the sea let all creation praise his name from the ends of the earth from the depths of the sea let all creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And God's people said, Well, I have the privilege of welcoming you as well and also want to extend a warm welcome to those who are worshiping online. And I think it's important for us to periodically acknowledge our volunteers that help us with streaming and help the, the online worship experience become a reality. That is really a, a significant responsibility and it's when it's done well, streaming is great. And thankfully our online presence is very good indeed. When it's not done well, it's terrible. I had the thought that, you know, if they put me at that responsibility, probably somehow I'd end up bringing up an old episode of Gilgan's Island. And, it, you know, it would, be t it would be terrible. It would not be good. So we're just really fortunate to have people who are capable and willing to help us with every aspect of technology. So for those of you who are here in person, if you'd go on and take out um, your flap on the, on the handout and fill out the information. There is one side for guests and there's another side for members. You can just complete that information and leave it there in the seat. We'll have somebody to pick those up a little bit later. Also, additionally, on your attendance slip, if you plan on being at the Wednesday night diner to eat, if you could indicate on that attendance slip how many from your family will be present. You can see what the menu is this week. We're gonna have mama's pizza and salad and there's kid-friendly items as well. We'll start serving at 5.30 and then we'll have classes at 6.30 on Wednesday evening. Also, if this is your first time with us and it certainly is or somebody, it's a first time for someone every Sunday. If you wanna go on and get your communion supplies, they're right there in the seat in front of you and we can be prepared accordingly for communion. For our contribution, we have some receptacles at the exits as you leave this room. And additionally, you can give online to the church website or mail your contribution uh, to the church uh, in a physical snail mail way. What a blessing it is to worship. And we pause in 
in an internal, quiet way, give thanks to God because we can worship. I have been reminded this past week of just how small my world really is. However, I've also been reminded that a number of my friends do not by any means live in a small world. As events in Ukraine have unfolded, since we met last Sunday, I was reminded quickly, I have friends who have adopted children from Ukraine. I have friends who have adopted children with special needs from Ukraine. And even friends who work with international adoption every single day. I had actually forgotten that I have a couple of colleagues who at one point in their ministry career served as resident missionaries in various cities in Ukraine. We have our own members who have been involved in short-term missions there. And I was clueless until this past week that even our ladies class that meets on Wednesday morning have sponsored children who are associated with Jeremiah's Hope, an orphanage there in Ukraine, and have sponsored about 15 children. I was really impressed with what the ladies class did. It's amazing how these things come to the surface at important times and you become aware. I'm listening very carefully to such individuals. Their thoughts and their perspective comes with tremendous credibility. They know what they're talking about. In a way, what they do is they help the rest of us put faces and names with people in a country that seems far, far away to us. So I'm not sure today is the time for a lot of commentary. Maybe that's more a time for silent reflection and meaningful prayer. So to lead us in that, I'm going to read the first five verses of Psalm 25. As we think about what's going on globally, as we think about Christians living in Ukraine at this very moment. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 5. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God and my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. I'm going to encourage us just to have a moment of silence here in just a second. But here's the challenge as we have a moment of silence. Let's break out of our little small world. And let's broaden our perspective and our thoughts about people and Christians living around the globe. Let's think about perhaps people and specifically Christians in Ukraine as a whole Perhaps the adults who are associated and committed to serving children at Jeremiah's Hope. Perhaps we think about the most vulnerable, orphans, older people. 
Let's pause for a moment of silence and then I'll lead us in prayer. Father, today as we worship, we think about those who are living in constant fear. We pray for those, Father, who are the most vulnerable, children, children without biological parents and other family members. Father, we pray that you will broaden our perspective and that our world won't be so small and we confess just how self-centered we can be. So focused on what we perceive we need or what we want. Father, we pray for our leaders globally, for wisdom and for submission to you. May we worship in a spirit of truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Colton Whitefield is participating in Leadership Training for Christ uh, song leading. He is gonna lead us in a song. Let's sing out and sing well and be encouraging of Colton this morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Colin Weifield, and I will be singing Standing on the Promises, verses 1 and 4. Mm. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let us praise His name. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. I cannot fall Listen every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. It's encouraging. It's encouraging to know what the next generation looks like, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Good job, Colton. We come to that part of the service where we take communion, the Lord's Supper. We meet around the table that used to be here, but it's a figurative table. Uh, we meet together to share in Christ's death, burial, and today like every Sunday, his resurrection. In Matthew, we read from chapter 28, verses 1 through 7, 
verses that we covered today in class. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, don't be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. The victory statement, he has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen. Amen. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my morning as we come to the table, the scripture reading is Luke 24, 46 and 47. This is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. As I focus this last few days on today, what communion means to us this morning. I don't think there's one of us that doesn't have our struggles, our hurts, our family problems. But the one thing that we all have in common as we come together this morning is we have hope. We have hope of living with Jesus in his coming kingdom. And as we participate this morning, we realize that, yes, Christ died for us, and we 
are aware of the pain and suffering that he went through for us. But also because he rose, we celebrate and we have that hope. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you this morning, Father, we ask you to forgive us as we tend to take this time for granted. We ask you to be with us as we focus on the celebration that we have with you. That you came and that you died for us. But you rose again so that we have that hope. And as we partake of the bread this morning, which represents your body, help us, help us to celebrate in that fact. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we continue this morning, I'll be reading from 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. What a glorious thought that we have that hope to look forward to spending eternity with him. Let's pray. Father God, what a merciful Father you are to love us so much that you sent your Son. For him to die for us is no small deed. Father, help us celebrate the fact that we do have that hope and that we celebrate in knowing that we are alive in him. Go with us now as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed for us, and help us celebrate in that fact. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
morning as we come to the part of our service where we have the opportunity to give let's read 2 Corinthians 5 15 and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again as we have the opportunity to give it's we realize that there's no greater gift than what our father gave to us Let's pray. Father God, what a blessed people we are that we're able to call you our Father and that, ha that we have the hope for eternity with you. Father, if we reflect on how blessed people we are, we pray that as we give this morning, we give with a cheerful heart and that we know that the things that that we give will be used according to your will. Forgive us when we fall short. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sing a song before John's lesson. You're the one. You're the one. You're the only one. Let's stand as we sing. Lord, the people praise you. Lord, the people praise you. Lift you up and raise you. Lift you up and praise you. And you are the Holy One. 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 The only one. The only one. The Lord, the people love you. Lord, the people love you. Place the body above. Place the body above you. And you are the Holy 
Do you have a problem with authority? Do you have a problem with authority? When I say authority, I am referencing legitimate authority. Do you have a problem with legitimate authority? Authority figures exercising their power in a legitimate and ethical manner. So I'll ask again, do you have a problem with authority? Last Monday was President's Day and school was out, so I had lunch over in Fort Worth with a friend of mine who is a public school teacher in the Metroplex in a high school over there. And how badly I have wished to go and have a little chat with his students. (laughs) Bobby and I went to high school together. We traveled all over the state of Texas doing cross-examination debate. And during our recent lunch this past Monday, we had a discussion regarding our respective visits to the principal's office. (laughs) It was not a short discussion by any means. Bobby told me that his mouth got him in trouble. And when he told me that, I get this very self-righteous look and stared at him and said, not me. (laughs) Not me at all. My mischievous plans that I actually chose to carry out, that's what got me in trouble repeatedly. Bobby went on to say, in my visits with Mr. Zorns, he was our assistant principal at Monterey High School. He said, in my visits with Mr. Zorns, I was always quick to admit my infractions. I'd own up to it. And he felt like that was a redeeming quality. And I said, yeah, it really is. And I told him, I said, I always told the truth. When it came right down to it, even the things that I did, I always told the truth. I never lied. And so we looked at each other. And at lunch at Abuelo's last Monday, the two of us declared ourselves wonderful students from the class of 1980. We just declared ourselves. We just decided after all these years, we're going to declare ourselves wonderful students. But the truth is, we were not. Because the truth is, we really did have a problem with authority. The truth is, we were kids who had a lot to learn about how to respond appropriately to legitimate authority. I'm wondering this morning if that is true of Christians as we grow in Christ, as we mature in Christ, do we come to a better understanding of what it means to submit to legitimate authority? I wonder sometimes, do you think Christians as a whole have a lot to learn about responding to authority in a way that honors God? I'm just curious if that's a real maturity track, so to speak, that all of us really need to experience. Do you know, do we, do we have to learn how to respond to authority as we grow in Christ? And is our inability to be submissive or our inability to respond to authority a real reflection of immaturity in Christ? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, elders are referred to as overseers. And that's actually a word in the New Testament that has a rich background. That term overseer, if we had the time to do a a word study, has a rich background. But suffice to say, what it's conveying is is that elders have a, a task that entails responsibility and leadership and, yes, authority. So I quickly concluded as I thought about this particular concept this week that when a person, a Christian, wholesalely rejects an elder as an overseer and rejects that person's leadership, it really says a lot about that individual's character. Really what it says is that person needs to grow up and to grow up in Christ. So today, I'm I'm going to finish up my series on the Gospel of Matthew. We spent this entire quarter in our adult Bible classes focusing on the Gospel of Matthew. 
And I have done likewise in my sermons. My, my sermon texts haven't always been the same exact address as we were in Bible class, but at least I was in the neighborhood. And as Kirk noted a moment ago, today we conclude by focusing on a resurrected Jesus. And more specifically today, we conclude this series by listening listening to what a resurrected Jesus had to say as he made final impressions on those who were his followers. Can you imagine being there? Can you actually imagine being there in person and being an eyewitness of his crucifixion? Actually, that's a very difficult thing to imagine. It was indeed violent. It was unpleasant. It's everything you can possibly imagine. But furthermore, can you imagine being an eyewitness to his resurrection? The tomb is empty. And furthermore, during the course of his resurrection appearances, you have this opportunity to interact with him and to actually have a conversation with him and to listen to him teach still one more time. Just a real quick sidetrack, but I think it's important. I mentioned this in class this morning as well. If the resurrection of Jesus was nothing more than a hoax, it was all just a cruel joke, then let's be reminded that Jesus had no shortage of enemies at all. Enemies who were in positions of influence and power. So if the resurrection was a hoax, they would have quickly and easily discredited the stories of the resurrection. But they didn't because they couldn't. And he continued to appear. Paul gives a vivid description in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of all the various appearances that occurred. And he continued to teach as he continued to appear. So for this morning, just a few moments, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, here's what it says. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When he saw them, they worshiped him but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we're reminded that Jesus has ultimate authority. I think I probably should pause here for a moment and ask the same question one more time. Before we go any further this morning, do do you really have a problem with authority? It's a subject that came up periodically. It's a subject that came up periodically during the course of Jesus' teaching ministry. Here's one particular incident. And just then some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts for which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say stand up and walk but so that you may know 
that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said then to the paralytic, stand up, take your bed, and go home. Wow, that's, that's an account in Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 6. And that definitely got people's attention, and it definitely really caused quite the stir among some of the religious leaders, the very idea that he would state that he had authority to forgive other people's sins. But even as people listened to him, even as people interacted with Jesus during the course of his ministry, they were, they were taken by his authority. They almost, as, almost as if they perceived it automatically. Because in Mark chapter 1, verse 22, the text says, the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority not as their teachers of the law. So it's not like his authority is confined to one place or one people or even one nation. He is the Lord of all nations, the ruler of all time and space. His authority is ultimate. I'm just curious. I'm just curious why do we recoil at the very idea of authority? And even the related term, submission is a related term. You're talking about recoiling. We don't like that word, do we? We don't like the idea of submitting to anyone. I think if the truth be known, we don't like to be told what to do. Do you like to be told what to do? There's an old West Texas phrase. A lot of y'all from West Texas, you know this phrase. Y'all know the phrase, bow up. Somebody bows up when they're told what to do. That's a good West Texas phrase. That's West Texas vernacular. They bow up. We are inclined to bow up because we are so incredibly independent. Now, I would add this thought. We are cooperative and we are responsive if it's our idea. Isn't that true? As long as it's my idea, I'm not pretty cooperative and I'm pretty responsive to anything you want me to do as long as I perceive it's all my idea. And I think we are all just all too aware of the danger of power and how much too much authority in the hands of one person can lead to corruption and in some case can lead to cruelty as well. And unfortunately, we also know how Christians have abused authority all in the name of Christ. So back to the text. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth, it's, it's all been given to me. So let me ask this this morning. I'm going to draw in your memory. When a person is baptized, what do we characteristically do? What do we do before baptism? If we were going to have a baptism this morning, right, right after the sermon, what do we characteristically do? We, we ask for a confession of faith, do we not? And we'll say something to the effect, something like this. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And just prior to that, just prior to somebody's baptism, somebody says yes. And generally that is followed with something to the effect, do you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life? Isn't that what we ask? And that individual who is preparing to be immersed in just a few moments answers in the affirmative. So when we say that, when we answer yes, just prior to our baptism, what we're saying is, is that we are accepting, we are embracing the lordship of Jesus in our life. So let, let me translate that lordship. I'm not sure that's a term that always communicates real well. So let me translate that for us. What that means is we are ultimately embracing his ultimate authority in our life from this point forward as we choose to be 
a follower of Jesus, as we choose to be his disciple and belong to him. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that look like? Because I'm kind of like you. I, sometimes I have a problem with authority. So what does it mean? It means that I make a commitment to obeying Jesus when I want to. And it also means I make a commitment to obeying Jesus when I don't want to as well. Let me take us back real quickly to last Sunday. Some of y'all may not have been here, so last Sunday we looked at Matthew chapter 25, and there is a parable that Jesus teaches. In Matthew's gospel account, it's the final teaching of Jesus prior to his arrest. And it's the parable of the sheep and the goats. And in verse 37, they ask him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a, a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And then in verse 40, in the context of a parable, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I had a conversation with somebody after that, this past week after that sermon. We had a discussion, well, who are the least of these? You know, who, who, who are the least of these that we serve? And of course, I always think of people who are vulnerable. And this conversation I was having, other person pointed out, maybe the least of these are those that are really difficult to love. People that are just uh, not easy, not easy people to interact with, not easy people to love, not easy people to reach out to. So I went back and I reread the parable. I thought, you know, in context, it kind of makes sense. The least of these, that could be people in prison. That could be people who are in desperate need, who need to be fed or need basic necessities of life, and they may not always be the most pleasant individuals to deal with. So in light of Matthew 25, I was reminded that responding to his authority means that I have to do things that are not necessarily my idea. Not necessarily how I would plan my day. Not necessarily how I would order my priorities. And it also means that I submit my frequently, very, very stubborn will to him to respond appropriately to his authority. I fully acknowledge I've got a stubborn streak that won't wait. And that means to lay it down and respond to his authority. And here may be the most difficult response to what does it mean? It means that his authority supersedes my comfort level. Every single day. Responding to him, responding to him in a spirit of submission means that supersedes what I perceive to be comfortable every single day. Well, in a sense, Jesus actually makes it clear what responding to his authority looks like, and it's, it's right here in this passage. Because in subsequent verses, in verse 19, he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a, it's a really deep theological phrase. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? This is, this is deep. Y'all ready? Okay, here it goes. This deep phrase is race and jump. Sounds deep, doesn't it? I'm convinced with this particular passage, we use the race and jump approach to this passage because what we do, we race through a lot of the meat of the passage and jump right to what it has to say about baptism. 
And in the process, we're jumping over some really important principles that are conveyed in the passages in order to get just to that thought. In fact, the truth is we jump over the primary imperative in the text. The primary thought is, since I have all authority, go and make disciples. That's the imperative. Go and make disciples. So jump and race to baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's, that misses the, the primary imperative. The, the imperative is go and make disciples. So if we're really convicted that Jesus was raised from the dead, if we have truly embraced his lordship in our life, then why would we not eagerly go out and tell others about him and teach them and teach them well and strive to make disciples? In reference to the parable from last week in Matthew chapter 25, I used the phrase, the importance of majoring the majors and minoring in the minors. And I think that's true. I think that's a a fitting response to his absolute authority to major in the majors and minor in the minors and to major in the majors is to go and make disciples of all nations. I know I sound really repetitive this morning, but it's important based on where we find ourselves. Do you have a problem with authority? You know, as I look back at my lunch conversation with Bobby, the truth is, as high school students, we just disregarded authority. We thought our authority superseded anybody else. So we, I mean, we were that arrogant. I think Bobby had visions of becoming a millionaire business tycoon. And now he's influencing kids as a public school teacher, which I think is really meaningful. I had plans to go to law school at Texas Tech, but because I got kicked off the date debate team as a senior, state-bound my scholarship to Texas Tech and to be on the debate team at Tech, that was all over and done. They showed me who had ultimate authority. We certainly needed to mature. We needed to grow up. Today, I really do understand that Jesus has all authority. And on that note, I am firmly convinced that the, re the bodily resurrection of Jesus is an historical fact. It really happened. But I still acknowledge I have a whole lot to learn still about submission to him. And I wonder about you. How about you? Do you have a lot to learn about submission to him? I, I need to grow in my understanding of his lordship. And when you say you want him to be the Lord of your life, what does that really mean? How about you? Where do you find yourself today? Self-willed and rebellious or in a spirit of submission? Stubborn, opinionated, but not, respect, but not receptive, and perhaps even arrogant. So a moment ago, I mentioned that, that deep theological thought, jump and race, we jump and race, we jump over these passages to get to the part about baptism. Well, let me say just a few words about that particular text on baptism here in Matthew chapter 28. I am firmly convinced that this passage during the resurrection appearance of Jesus makes the most clear and concise call for baptism that you're going to read anywhere. It's as crystal clear as it can be. If you're going to be his disciple, that's such an important commitment to make, a primary fundamental commitment. So we'll provide that opportunity this morning, and we're going to provide the opportunity to ask the same questions that I asked a moment ago do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and do you want him to be the Lord of your life? And we indeed will baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe we can sing an invitation song this morning. Let's stand and sing. Tell me the story of Jesus right on my heart every word.
today. Amen. Amen. John, you got kicked off the debate team. <laughs> wow. I am so glad I didn't, I wasn't like you when I was a kid. <laughs> My little brother, four years younger than I am, I, in 1968, I was a senior. He was a ninth grader in Amarillo, Texas. I don't know how long the record stood, but he and his brother Jim held the record at Austin Junior High for the most swats of any kid that's ever gotten in one year. Man, I'm glad I wasn't like him either. I was the gentle, calm one of the family. Well, we're glad that you were here. Um, the attendance thing that you tore off, if you just leave that in the seat, uh, those will be picked up later. Uh, we sing our last song today. Uh, Jeff Jeffries, one of our shepherds, will dismiss us with a prayer. You are my strength when I am weak. You are my strength when I speak. You are my tell any stories about me growing up after that. <clears throat> I, there, were some, there was some doubt, so I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for that message, John. And Mike, thank you for your words uh, during communion. As one of my idols used to say, let's, let's make this a great day. And with that, We'll have a prayer and we'll be excused. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come today and to lift you up and to worship you with our, from our hearts, uh, with our total being. We ask that you bless those in Ukraine and, and those other countries that border Russia. We ask that you uh, give our world leaders courage and, and peace and give them wisdom uh, to make the decisions that according to your will. And now we ask that you go with us as we leave this place. Let us be the light that you intend for us to be in this community and in the world around us. It's through your son that we pray. Amen.